Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm actually very excited today to be here to hear my friend and colleague, uh, Eldar Haber, talk about uh, digital expungement and rehabilitation of the digital age. Um, thinking about the right to be forgotten in a criminal context in places where you don't actually have the right to be forgotten, I suppose. Uh, Eldar is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, Haifa University, and a faculty associate here at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Um, he uh, earned his PhD from Tel Aviv University and completed his postdoc studies as a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center as well. Uh, his main research interests consist of various facets of law and technology, including cyber law, intellectual property law, with a focus on copyright, privacy, civil rights and liberties, and criminal law. He is the author of the forthcoming book on criminal copyright uh, that will be published by Cambridge University Press. I will turn it over now to Eldar. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you, Patrick, for uh, that kind introduction. Thank you for the Berkman Klein community for inviting me here. And thank you for joining us here uh, physically and uh, live on the internet. So my project actually started uh, when I was a fellow here at the Berkman Center working on the right to be forgotten. Now I'll say this is not a project on the right to be forgotten per se. This is more on criminal rehabilitation, uh, like Patrick, Patrick just said, when you don't have a right to be forgotten and when you cannot legislate a right to be forgotten because of various constitutional barriers, for example. Now this project mainly deals with the problems that uh, criminal law entails for someone who was convicted of a crime and later wants to not simply rejoin society but also to reintegrate into society. So if we look at pre-modern times, for example, we used to have the penalty of outlawry in which people who, after, upon release, couldn't really join society. They experienced some sort of a civil death. They didn't really have rights. They couldn't vote. They couldn't own property. Sometimes their lives even were considered so worthless that even murdering them carried impunity. Now, in modern societies, we started to acknowledge the importance of rehabilitation as one of the main pillars of criminal law. Rehabilitation serves various purposes, uh, such, of, such as the reformation of those who were convicted to try to help aid them actually reintegrate into society, but also to reduce recidivism. Somewhere along the way in the 1970s, we saw an approach in the US which was a tough on crime approach. It was a zero to tolerance approach towards criminals. It didn't, mean, it, did, it didn't matter if it was a misdemeanor or a felony. There were a lot of different uh, prosecutions, and we saw that it led to mass amount of incarceration rates uh, in the U.S., which is uh, the world leader per population for incarceration rates. Now, along the way, somewhere in the beginning of the 21st century, we saw a transition, some sort of a transition in approach, which acknowledged the importance of rehabilitation in criminal law. It's called a smart on crime approach, in which uh, we are trying to differentiate the DOJ, for, uh, for that instance, tries to differentiate between different kind of felonies and misdemeanors and would not prosecute uh, entirely everyone all the time. It will not resolve, result into a zero tolerance approach. Now, this smart on crime approach also led to the formation of reentry courts, for example, that would aid those who try to rejoin society and actually enable them to reintegrate into society as well. Now, the reason that we have rehabilitation along the way are the collateral consequences of criminal law. We can loosely define them as any additional penalties outside of the criminal law realm. So we can do a categorization, a subcategorization of dividing them between state collateral consequences and social collateral consequences. So the state would be anything that is imposed by the state, like the right to serve a jury, or denying the right to serve on a jury, uh, denying to vote, you might be deported, you could be denied of higher education, um, any federal housing, you might be restricted from flying, etc., etc. Also, we can see the social collateral consequence, consequences, which basically come from the stigmatization of criminal law. The stigma that we carry could deprive you from Usually, it will be employ employers that will probably won't want to hire you. Uh, 
Uh, it could be landlords that would want, will not want to rent you an apartment, and it could be also institutional, like uh, edu higher education facilities, private ones, that would, might deny you uh, when you have a criminal history record. Basically, it means that you will be stigmatized. You will wear a scarlet letter as long as you have had been convicted of a crime. For that reason, a lot of different legislators around the world and policymakers had, came up with something which is called expungement legislation. This expungement legislation is a process by which criminal history could be later vacated, sealed, reversed, purged, or destroyed by the state. Now, this terminology, just for the sake of this talk, doesn't really matter in the sense of expungement means something a little bit different from sealing a record. But generally, we can address it as something which is basically the process which is described here, in which enables rehabilitation by the mere fact that you can declare truthfully that you do not have a criminal history records if the state had uh, let you that right to announce that you do not, you did not commit a crime. Now, this is important for the process of rehabilitation in general. What happened in the kinetic world, the pre-digital world, is that there was some sort of a zoning effect in the sense that, yes, criminal history records, even after expungement, could have been obtained in various ways. I mean, if the media reported in the 60s that you committed a crime, it is highly possible that you can go to that archive even after expungement and try to find that needle in that haystack of whether or not uh, you ever committed a crime and it was reported by the media. But eventually, uh, we saw here what is termed as practical obscurity in the sense that even if it is accessible, somehow it was the kinetic world had that zoning effect that you cannot really get that record. Thus, expungement worked to some extent. And then came the digital age. Now, it's not only big data as I show here, it's data. Data is accessible in various ways and it pertains to criminal history records all the time. Now, there are two main reasons why it happens. The first of them is a practice which is called data brokers. Data brokers, which you are probably familiar with, sell information. There are commercial vendors who sell various types of information, some of which are criminal history records. Why? Because there's a market for it. Employers would like, a lot of employers would like to know whether or not the candidate has a criminal history record or not. Along the way somewhere, uh, it's 1998, uh, the federal government regulated it to some extent, and I'll talk about it in a few seconds. The second aspect which interests me more in this type of research is the internet in general. So it's not only search engines, and I'll talk about the various sources, but the internet in general provides mass amount of information, it's easily searchable, and because of different practices of data analysis and big data analysis, we can easily find out, find out if someone had a criminal history record. So let's go back to the data brokers for, for, uh, for understanding why it is important to regulate it. So we saw that data brokers were regulated under the FCRA, the Federal uh, Credit, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, it was added to the, to the FCRA in 1998 out of the perceived need to do something with those criminal history records. So there are a lot of different sections. This is an example, for example, as an example of what does it regulate? So, first of all, it defines what a consumer reporting agency is. So you can see it means any person which, for monetary fees, dues, or an, or an a co cooperative non-profit basis, regulatory engaged in whole or in part in practice of assembling, evaluating consumer data, credit information, or other information which pertains to criminal history records for the purpose of furnishing consumer reports to third parties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this is uh, how it's defined. Then those agencies have some requirements by the FCRA. So for example, they have to adopt reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy in a manner which is fair and equitable to the consumer in regard to confidentiality, accuracy, relevancy, and proper utilization of such information. 
So you can stop here and say, you know what, that solves the problem because when you have the accuracy requirement, if something was expunged, then uh, you might be able to ask those data brokers to update those records. What happens in practice is that a lot of, a lot of them don't, especially because they find a way out of being categorized as a consumer reporting agency. It's a very vague definition which you can easily bypass by several different mechanisms, which they do. And even if they do, the, one of the problems here are the sanctions that are really enforced, but that's a different matter. On this subject, a lot of scholars, excellent scholars, have written how to better regulate the practices of data brokers. But what I'm suggesting here is that the problem is a bit bigger or much, much bigger. So just to finish the, the requirement of the FCRA, it also places some restrictions on employers. It eventually says that employers must notify job applicants prior to obtaining a criminal history report to obtain their consent and inform them if an adverse action was taken based on the report. Now, one of the problems here is oversight. It's really difficult to know what employers are doing uh, and how they're doing it. And the second problem here is the fines that usually are not enforced if employers uh, are doing so. Once again, this is not the main theme of my research. When we're looking at consumer reporting agencies, we know that search engines or any other online intermediaries will not be deemed as consumer reporting agencies after the FCRA. I will leave a question mark on data brokers because, as I said, because of the vague definition of what a consumer reporting agency is, it is fairly easy to bypass those requirements. That leads us to the Internet. So on the Internet, there are various ways that we can find criminal history records. So as you might see here as well, you'll always have a disclaimer of any sort online that will say uh, this, is, this cannot be used for employment or tenant screening and this is not a consumer reporting agency as defined by the FCRA. The fact that it's written doesn't make it true, but they write it anyhow. So we have all these instant checkmates which are usually uh, data brokers which just try to lure you in to find, uh, to, to make you pay money for uh, an actual report. But the real problem is that we have various sources online that could produce results that have criminal history records of individuals, even after expungement. So we can think about the legal websites, for example. So legal search databases like LexisNexis, Westlaw, and Justia uh, offer you to go access case law. And you can read about verdicts, you can read the names because nothing is anonymized usually, or most things are not anonymized. And even after expungement, some of them will be accessible through search engines, some of them will be even free, and some of them are available throughout a subscription, which is not something which is difficult to obtain. Another practice, which is fairly unique to the US, are mugshot websites. Uh, mugshot websites, and this is an old photograph. I must say that, as you'll see, you can unpublish a mugshot which you cannot do anymore. This is from nine or 10 months ago, which I, I'm using deliberately to show you uh, something which happened, the practice which happened and ceased for the time being. So you can, we can, I'll talk about that in a second. So first of all, you can do, see the different disclaimers that we have uh, about, of course, they're not a consumer reporting agency. They publish truthful information, if it, even if it's not updated. Uh, they are. They, they are protected by the First Amendment to do so, et cetera, et cetera. What they do is that they publish mugshots, uh, those photographs which are taken during an arrest, and they publish the details. So I had anonymized because it would defeat my purpose to publish them and to have them webcasted all nine. Uh, but uh, just to, to, to get a sense of what's going on there. So this is um, almost 10, 10 months old. Uh, you, there, there was a photograph here which I can tell you it was a man who was uh, brutally uh, beaten up. Uh, there was a large fight somewhere in, in New York, in the state of New York. And this mugshot basically uh, found its way to the internet very quickly. So I tried to do a Google uh, uh, search three weeks later. And you'll have to trust me on this, but the fifth and the sixth results were actually on that incident, and we're not talking about expungement yet. We're talking about arrest records, someone who wasn't even indicted yet, 
let alone convicted. And if we look at the images on top, four out of five were the mugshot. Now, there weren't, actually just one of them was from the website that I showed you, mugshots.com, which is an example of one out of hundreds of websites like this. Three other were from other resources, which I'll talk about shortly. Now for the unpublishing mugshot uh, part. Uh, so this doesn't exist anymore, actually, because of different uh, legislative um, there were different bills pending, and the mugshot websites decided uh, to remove them because of unfair practices. Uh, it was some sort of an extortion, and therefore uh, they removed even the possibility to be forgotten under this. But as you, can, as you might see, uh, to be unpublished a year ago would have required you to pay almost $400. Uh, the, I wrote that I want to be uh, deleted because it was expunged or sealed, but you can write whatever reason you want. Now, I will not discuss the various implications of this extortion practices. Uh, they are long, no longer available through mugshots.com, but hopefully uh, they won't be available either. But they do raise the question of how to do that, how to actually be deleted. So before we getting into the various different aspects of how to regulate this, uh, Another source that we have is the media. So it doesn't have to be the Sunday Times. It doesn't have to be the New York Times. It could be local media, usually, which will report an arrest uh, of someone or a conviction of someone in the neighborhood. And when we had, in the kinetic world, uh, th that possibility of confining that information on the Internet, it will live on in the U.S. Finally, we have the social media, and we have the fact that people talk. So if people talked in the kinetic world, it could have affected you to some extent. But the fact that the internet remembers everything, the fact that we can post it on social media websites, uh, and uh, if you'll browse through those mugshot websites, you'll see that you will always have the opportunity to tweet about an arrest or to publish it on Facebook. So they make it rather easy to use social media to make that information live on. So at this point of the project, I started to think, how can we enable digital expungement? The easy way would be to suggest that the U.S. must adopt a right to be forgotten, right? But to be practical, I'm not suggesting this, because it, is, it would be deemed unconstitutional, as I'll talk in a second. So before trying to understand how the U.S. can enable digital expungement, I try to think of the ways that we can enable digital expungement. So if we categorize them, we have two main ways. The first way would be an ex-ante approach, which would mean making expunged criminal history records initially unavailable. Now, there's a problem here. There's an inherent problem here, because how would you know when a record is expunged initially? You wouldn't, right? So there's a way to handle this little problem as well, and I'll discuss it later. The most common approach would be to take an ex post approach, making expunged criminal histories inaccessible or unusable once they are expunged. So that would relate to a right to be forgotten, as I said. But before going to the law, if we take Professor Lori La La Lawrence Lassig's uh, four modalities approach, we can start thinking about how can we regulate it not through the law. So if we'll take a market approach or social norms, uh, approach to influence those mugshots, for example, or expunge criminal history records in general, there are a lot of different problems here that will not solve it. Why? Because there's, first of all, there's a market failure of some sort, or more accurately, we have a market for these things. I mean, a lot of people do want to know that information, whether they are employers, whether they are your neighbors, they do want to know who lives in the neighborhood, who are they hiring, who are they uh, lending something or renting their house. In the aspect of social norms, I mean, that would take time. It would take a lot of time and would still be problematic because of the nature of the market here that we have so many interested, interested parties who want this information. So even if we deem it unacceptable to publish those mugshots, we will still have those mugshot websites operating and people who would want to access, uh, access them will. Can technology save it? So technology could, to some extent, aid us here 
Um, and it goes back to a lot of literature that had been written, uh, including myself, on the right to be forgotten and how technology can aid in anonymization and in various aspects of, of granting civilians uh, the reputation management uh, tools to try to de-emphasize uh, things. As technology and market combined, for example, Google is an example of someone who acknowledged the problem of mugshot websites. And what they did, attempted to do at least a year ago, is try to de-emphasize. They didn't delist or delink anything. They tried to de-emphasize the appearance of mugshot websites on search results. Uh, as you see before that, my search was, after Google tried to do that, it was, it was fairly accessible still. However, we can see that technology can aid to some extent, but probably it will need uh, the assistance of regulation or legislation. So we need a law. But how can we use the law in a country in which uh, there's such a big emphasis on free speech? So naturally, it would go to a right to delist, update, expunge criminal records. So just as a background, we all know the famous right to be forgotten, which started from, uh, started from 95, but it was interpreted uh, under the Google Spain case, the famous case, which interpreted Article 6 of Directive 95. We're not going to talk about the problems of the right to be forgotten here. That would be for a different talk. And then uh, later, the, in two, a year from now, we'll have the GDPR, which will come into force and will grant a more structured, I would say, right to erasure, which is basically a right to be forgotten as well. And it will aid those uh, individuals also with expunged criminal records, probably. Now, if I would have suggested something which is not a right to be forgotten, but a more narrowly tailored right to only delist information or delete even information which pertains to those who their records was expunged, I would suggest something like this. We'll have an individual, he served time, he or she can serve time, uh, on, and upon release, let's say five years later, their record was expunged. Now, they will get a certificate which is acknowledged around the world, a, certific a certificate of uh, good conduct, for example. Uh, it could be digital, it could be physical, that they would do, no longer have a criminal history record. Now, with this certificate, they could easily approach whoever is interested, like data brokers or any online intermediate, and ask them legally to either update the information or delist or even delete that information. Will that be constitutional? No, it won't, because uh, it would still impede upon free speech. It will not pass the very difficult, strict scrutiny of, of the First Amendment because it's a form of a content-based restriction, meaning that eventually it has to be uh, narrowly tailored to serve a uh, state purpose of the highest order. To that extent, uh, case law, when referred to rehabilitation, for example, usually notes that rehabilitation is not a state uh, interest of the highest order. But even if it does pass that, it has to be narrowly, ta na narrowly tailored in the sense that it, it shouldn't be uh, um, overbroad or under-inclusive or over-inclusive, and it will not pass this very highly difficult and almost impossible test. So my proposition would be try to look at public and private records a little bit different. When we go back to the EU and a lot of different jurisdictions around the world, the notion of what should be public is a bit different than the US. I mean, in the US, we know that court records should be open to the public. Now, I try to contest that a little bit. The reasoning behind that are usually public safety, transparency, and theories of punishment. So if we think about the public safety argument, the public safety argument would be we need to protect the public out of those who are, think about it, arrested, and later on, someone who was convicted of a crime. Now, when we try to balance that with rehabilitation for someone who was convicted of a crime, the public safety, safety argument is a bit problematic. It's even more problematic when you think about someone who was arrested. Why should we warn the public on anyone who has been simply, merely arrested, shouldn't the state at this point 
argue whether or decide whether he, he or she is dangerous enough that we need to use the other models of criminal punishments like incapacitation. We need to remove them from society. He, needs, he will not be released uh, with bail or without. That's part of the public safety argument which doesn't necessarily prevail uh, about the openness of court records. The second prong is transparency. So, and I do agree with this transparency argument to some extent. I mean, the transparency argument says that we need to try and see what happens in those state agencies, which is important to see what happens in police departments, who is arrested for what reason. Uh, court proceedings are important to be transparent to some extent that we might be able to get oversight. This oversight is by those estates, by the fourth and the fifth estates that could see what's going on. But for transparency, we don't really need the names of the defendants. We don't need the names for those who are arrested. We only need to know what's going on in the proceeding. I mean, using anonymization, something which is very common in many jurisdictions for names, even after conviction, is something which is, is common and still uh, could accomplish transparency in that sense. Last but not least, we have theories of punishment. So theories of punishment in this sense would argue that under the deterrence theory, uh, it is important to publish the names because it would deter more people of committing crimes because they see that those people were arrested. So first of all, we can use anonymization and still deter people. Second of all, I'm not sure that the deterrence theory applies here and the deterrence theory in general has a lot of criticism on when it works. I'm not saying it doesn't work always, but in criminal law, there's a lot of different criticism about deterrence as one of the main theories of punishment. And generally, it shouldn't be part of, of the justification to uh, keep those court records open. The second theory of punishment here is retribution, which would argue that this is part of the sentence. Getting your name published and shame, this public shame is important as a form of retribution. But arresting someone shouldn't be a form of retribution because, he, the, the, because of the presumptions of innocence. If we don't know, we are still don't know what this guy or this girl had done, we cannot punish them yet. Even when we think about retribution, and that goes back to the theories of collateral consequences, there are different debates about whether someone has served his time, and we know that, that phrase, when you finished your jail time, that's supposed to be it. So some people argue that we should still uh, have a lot of different uh, punishments outside of jail. I'm not part of these people who argue this, uh, and, and the collateral consequences here are so intrusive in the sense that you, can, you are experiencing some form of a civil death. That's why retribution, to that extent, doesn't work. What I'm suggesting mainly is, and I'm still saying, if you cannot have a right to be forgotten and not a narrowly tailored one, I would suggest doing a graduated approach of some sort, and the term terminology can change, to how we perceive what should be public records and what shouldn't be. That graduated approach will start with something which I'm not dealing with. It's not expungement, it's arrest records. My suggestion is that, first of all, non-conviction criminal history records should remain private. I mean, before an indictment, we shouldn't publish the names that someone of someone who has just been arrested, let alone the photographs, the mugshots, because of the presumption of innocence. But if we move towards to expungement, we have to differentiate between offenses that are eligible for expungement and those that are not. So just to clarify, all states in the US have some sort of an expungement or sealing uh, procedures, statutes. They, are, they differ, and, and I'm not going to go into the, the small details, but Mostly, when we talk about misdemeanors, they will fall under expungement. Some felonies will as well, especially if they're nonviolent crimes. So if we take an ex ante approach, differentiate between those offenses, and we will anonymize the names upon conviction even, 
courts, the re-entry courts, could examine whether those individuals are eligible for reform, for rehabilitation, for expungement. If they're not, if you murdered someone, you will be published, even prior to that, because that's not eligible for expungement. But if you might be, then I would leave that anonymized, because those arguments of public safety, if the state thinks that you have that ability to be reformed, don't, don't apply here. We can make some exceptions, and it's important to make some exceptions. I mean, we know uh, different statutes that pertain to different forms of activities which might be regulated more. So let, I will give an example. If an employer is even required by law because it works with a vulnerable population, for example, uh, to check the criminal history records of uh, a candidate, then the state will have its database, it already does, which they could apply simply, ask if this individual has had a criminal uh, history record, if it, if it was expunged or not, and then they will get a response directly from an updated database. And there are other exceptions uh, which we, we can discuss later. So mainly my, my research, this project, and it's a first part of a three-part project, uh, deals with the intersection between criminal law and technology, something which I always valued and, and liked researching. In the essence, this type of what I try to do here in, in this article, which uh, will be published uh, in Maryland Law Review, what I try to do here is try to develop a theoretical framework of digital expungement to understand the rationals behind it, going back to rehabilitation in general. There are many excellent scholars which have built upon and had written about this, especially in recent years. But one of the theoretical frameworks which has to be developed, uh, to my view, is the internet, not those data brokers simply, but all those search engines and intermediaries which makes this information so accessible and things will, will be more and more, more and more difficult in the future. Now, I'll just briefly tell you the second part of the project, which I, I haven't started yet. It's uh, depending on a grant which I apply to because it, it evolves around empirical work which I need to have uh, some assistance with. Uh, what I want to do is, if you can remember the slide that I show you about the Google and the search that I made to try to see how, how much uh, an individual with a record, this is not an expunged record, but a record uh, is actually accessible through Google. So what I intend to do is I gathered roughly 2,000 names of individuals with expunged criminal history records, and don't ask me how I obtained them. Uh, and it's legal, <laughs> but I will not reveal it uh, here. But uh, I wanted to take those individuals and really map out what's going on over the internet. What I want to do is try to see how many of their results will still appear in Google, for example, other search engines as well. Uh, let's say the top 10 results, the top five results, top three results, and those images like Google images that they appear. And there are very different analytic tools which I will use there statistically to understand what is, where is the problem arising from? So for example, if we're talking about mugshot websites, if 95% of this information arises from mugshot websites, then we might not need a right to be forgotten, we just need to find a way to regulate those mugshot websites. But uh, from preliminary results that I got, that isn't the case. I mean, mugshot websites are uh, accountable for more than 50% of the results, maybe, but uh, we still see a lot of social media websites, for example, that are just designed for this. So if you'll quickly browse through any social media website like Facebook, and you'll start searching for groups with uh, mugshot in it, and I do not want to give ideas to anyone, but it's just simply that you'll find so many of these in smaller communities that have the ability to report that something happened in your neighborhood, in your city, in your town, and even across the state. Uh, is it media? Media would be much more difficult to regulate to some extent. Could be possible even in the US, but it would be uh, highly, highly difficult. And if it's those websites that offer legal service, legal test case, uh, case law services, sorry, uh, like LexisNexis, uh, then we might take a different approach. Generally, my view here is that criminal history records should not be eternal. I mean, if we're trying, if we acknowledge 
If we don't acknowledge rehabilitation, that's another thing. But if we acknowledge, and state legislator have acknowledged the importance of expungement legislation, the mere fact that technology enables us to bypass expungement legislation shouldn't exist, and we should try to resolve this in a matter in which we'll be consistent with our core values in society, constitutional barriers even, but still uh, we should try to eliminate the fact that people have an eternal criminal record. Thanks. A quick Q and A from the audience. Um, sure. Let's start here. I'll come to you with the mic. Right. I always assumed that extortion was the business model for mugshots.com. If they no longer offer ex uh, their own version of expungement, then what keeps them going? Okay. So first of all, traffic probably. I mean, if they have traffic, and I don't know, we have to examine how much traffic they have, how much they get from advertising. Uh, if if you've seen before, and you can you can go to mugshots.com, you see that they advertise a lot of these different background checks, uh, data brokers. So I think there's a linkage there in which they make money other ways. Now, it would be interesting to your question to see how much money they actually made out of those. I mean, I don't know how many people were willing to pay those $400 and more just to get their mugshot uh, removed. Great. Other questions from the crowd here? Yeah? So at the uh, highest level, how would you balance off the public's interest in seeing how the highest level of expungement, the pardon powers that belong to the executive, um, are uh, uh, properly publicized. We, do, we have an interest in seeing who the president pardons at the end of his term, how many of them are related yeah. to campaign donors, how many of them are yeah. perhaps serious criminals, et cetera. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a very good question. I mean, that's part of the conundrum or the problem that the right to be forgotten has. I mean, how can you understand, how can you uh, determine who is a public figure for that sense to know whether or not to remove information. So there are various mechanisms in which, for example, Google uses right now under guidelines, uh, bless you, under guidelines uh, uh, that were published in the EU. Uh, they're not perfect. What you would usually do is, under the exceptions that I, I, I mentioned before, you would try to see if he is a public figure. That could be an exception. You would de-anonymize, for example, those results, and then you can you can always reverse it back and anonymize it if needed. It would be a bit problematic without a right to delete information, but it would be some sort of uh, yeah, adjustment. Great. Other questions? I also, you know, I had a thought also as we were, you were walking through some of this, and it, and it, and it ties into your question as well, which is um, how equally distributed will this privacy be in a system that isn't ex ante, right? If you have a system where there's, there's some process involved, how accessible will that process be? Will it only be available to people who have the resources to prosecute their kind of, um, their, their, their case to whoever, mugshots.com or whoever it is, right? So, well, I'm trying to still, I mean, the process itself would be, we can have various types of oversight mechanisms over processes like this, even if we're going for an end ex ante approach. But generally what I mean in the ex ante approach would be just, uh, it would be the anonymization, basically, of case law. Uh, uh, not the ex ante approach. I mean, uh, I mean on the, the other side, yeah, the ex post. Well, I'm not. Well, the ex post approach. We see those problems under the right to be forgotten. I mean, uh, there are some oversight mechanisms. It's a problem. I've written about it uh, uh, specifically. I wrote a paper which is called the uh, the privatization of the judiciary and the problems in which we see giving that private entity uh, the power actually and the pr prerogative to decide what's going on. It's a huge problem. What I am suggesting, for example, to solve this problem would be uh, we need need to have oversight mechanisms in which we'll have some sort of agencies which should examine what happens under those decisions. The problem, however, it would be that Google, for example, faces a lot of decisions uh, on the right to be forgotten, and it would be really difficult to get proper oversight. So another suge suggestion would be try to look at this problem uh, of the right to be forgotten as a polluter's pays principle, which we are acknowledged from environmental law. I mean, let's say that Googles of the world pollute with the information, inaccurate information, expunged records information. We should not let them be 
a courthouse for deciding what should or should not be online. What we should or might do is just impose the economic restrictions, make them pay for the pollution by paying the state, which will could hire with that money those officials, judges, retired judges maybe, who could form a consortium that will really examine whether or not to remove. So that would be, I would say, the best solution in which we can do it. It is really enforceable, but it could also have proper oversight. I see, I see. Yes. Let me get you the microphone. I'm a little confused, and it's probably because I'm just um, unknowing about what's going on. Is there, I know there, there is a right to be, there's a law that's a right to be forgotten in Europe. There's a regulation, Part, certain yes. countries, maybe all Europe. But that does not, to my knowledge, exist here. It couldn't exist here. Right. So I'm not, so, so there's no movement to create that here. That's, I guess that's my first question. No. So that's, I, I, that, there, well, there's nothing. I, I mean, there are people who could argue that uh, the, the U.S. should have a right to be forgotten, but... Uh, when you look at uh, the Constitution, the First Amendment, and the interpretation of the Supreme Court on, on how free speech uh, should be, could be uh, regulated, you understand that there's no real feasible way to have a right to be forgotten. So <clears throat> could you explain how the European right to be forgotten is relevant to how it's related to the U.S.? Um, right to have your, if your record is expunged, how that's related to the digital expungement? So, um, what I would say is that it's not because only on the theoretical level we can try to understand the right to be forgotten and try to understand how it could apply, be, be implemented in the U.S. Well, it can't. And that's why this ex post approach is not feasible and we have to go to other ex ante measures those ex ante measures are not a right to be forgotten, are simply a way to initially make public records non-public. So if the public records are not public initially from the arrest and after conviction as well, we won't need a right to be forgotten for expunged criminal history records because they will never, in quotation marks, never be published. They might be published to some extent. I mean, you cannot forbid someone uh, for, uh, just think about the Sixth Amendment, for example. If, if we need courts to be open to the public, you have a right for a public trial. So we cannot simply say to the media, never attend trials. So media might be able to publish, but that's anecdotal. I mean, you'll have some cases which will be reported online, and that won't help entirely. But it will still substantially reduce the amount of information of people with criminal history records, even if... Uh, it was expunged as long as we make that information not public initially and in that point in which you committed either committed a crime like murder which is not entitled for expungement or that time has elapsed and you weren't reformed the state has declared that you have no possibility of expungement then we might publish his or her name uh, in that sense. Um, thank you for this. This is a, an, an impressively challenging problem. And uh, you started out with talking about the effects that the lack of expungement has on people, such as discrimination. Is it more feasible, perhaps, just to target that discrimination, that you're not allowed to discriminate against people with a criminal history, bearing in mind that it would likely still have the same challenges that we have with any discrimination legislation yeah. of enforcement? Or is this a, a more straightforward way, do you think, to, to deal with the issues that, that are brought up? Okay, so, so excellent question. I would say that the problem with discrimination here is enforcement and oversight, basically. So we saw that the FCRA, for example, does a lot of anti-discrimination against employers, that they will not look into the criminal history records of candidates. But how can we really enforce that? I mean, even with the high fines, and we saw a lot of these different employers or landlords will just see this as 
cost of doing business, for example. So they will just weigh and see, is it costly enough for me to, to get a $2,000, $100, $1,000, or a million dollar fine even for screening a huge company with a lot of candidates. Now that's even employers, it's easier to see. Now, landlords will be really hard to enforce whether or not they discriminate upon a Google search which they've made, which no one knows if they made or not, or it's not that no one knows, a lot of people do, but that the important people here that will try to enforce this anti-discrimination anti laws will probably, it will be a bit difficult for them to achieve. So how many people have already checked mugshots.com today? Right? <laughs> Just right here at the lunch, right? We gotta make sure. It, it is interesting, the, the, there's this idea that um, if these groups are popping up on Facebook and other places, that perhaps we're trying to legislate away uh, social norms, right? Like we're trying to change social norms through legislation yeah. rather than addressing the real, the real issue, which is the discrimination angle. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, for sure. I was interested to see um, some of the websites disclaiming FCRA um, applicability on their home pages. Um, have, has there been any pushback from their ability to do that? Um, there are some challenges. I mean, mugshots.com, for example, uh, have various types of case law pending right now against various types of things they are doing there, including the one that they just removed. Um, I would say that it would be difficult for them to be challenged under the FCRA requirements because, uh, in fact, how the FCRA is right now written, they're not consumer reporting agencies. I do agree with them. I mean, data brokers is a different problem here. But those websites are not. They do have a lot of different, sorry, problems which are challenged right now in courts, and we'll have to wait and see other results of that case law. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those other types of challenges? Um, so I said the main, I mean, the main challenges right now are the unpublished mugshots because it, there are extortion practices. Uh, some people do claim that uh, under defamation law, for example, that uh, they publish something which is untruthful information. But then Mugshot's website says that it is truthful. I mean, maybe it's outdated, it was 20 years ago, but we are allowed by the Constitution to say that you were arrested 20 years ago. Doesn't matter if you're expunged or not. So a lot of the challenges are whether or not this defamation, <coughs> I'm sorry, and uh, a lot of people say that they couldn't get a job because of mugshots.com and those mugshot websites, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying to, to persuade the courts uh, to rule in, in their favor, it will be a challenging one. I mean, it's hard here because of the First Amendment to grant them that right. Uh, and and, and this, is the source of information that the sites like Mugshots and... So and, they and gather it from various police departments and courts. And um, what data brokers are doing actually is getting bulk information from the state. I mean, that's why it's not updated. They get bulk amount of information. They have, uh, they don't update it because they just don't, well, there's a market for that inaccurate or unupdated information. Uh, and therefore, that's just the way they work. I mean, it's a big data practice in which, oh, the police departments. You can, you can also go to online to some of the, the police departments uh, uh, and see just mugshots, arrest records that they publish. They are less accessible than mugshots.com, but you can do it. Is part of this maybe a data quality problem then at the state side that they are releasing information that they shouldn't have been releasing in the first place? Or? Well, it might have been, but if, if, if you look at, I mean, the main justification here would be that everything should be public from the second of an arrest. So there could be a solution here and say, okay, everything should be public, but should we retract a little bit and say, let's go back to the time where people had to go to the courthouse to actually take the file. So data brokers used to work with those runners, their personnel, who upon an inquiry of an employer, for example, they would go to court and, and ask the police department to ask whether this specific individual has had a criminal history record. So we can retract and we can impose, maybe through technology, maybe through uh, other legal measures, we can impose them with restrictions on how to disseminate information. I mean, the state will do it to itself, but the problem is that it's also a market. I mean, they do get paid. The state also gets paid a little bit about on, on the information that they uh, hand out to data brokers and, and to the public as well. So there's a trade-off here which could work a little bit. Not sure it will. So, so an argument against open data in government. That's well. great. Um, <laughs> just a joke. Um, 
So uh, interesting though, what, if, I, if I'm say uh, one of these people and I find my mugshot and it shouldn't have been there on mugshots.com, please don't search. Um, and I find that, uh, do I, in, in, in addition to any maybe cause of action I have against mugshots.com, do I also have a potential cause of action against the state for releasing the data that's in the first good, place? That's, that's a very good question. I mean, um, it, it depends what the state did. I mean, how, it, how, how the information was disseminated. But when we know how the information is disseminated, you might have a claim against the state. Uh, it depends a lot of, well, it depends on state law usually on how defamation law works in that particular state, for example, because that would be, I think, the main cause of action. It could be tort law to, for some extent, but I think, yeah, I think you might have an action, cause of action. Interesting. Any other questions from the crowd before we wrap up here? Yeah, great. We'll let you have the final word. Well, we'll have final question. The weekly newspaper in my, in my little city of Somerville and probably you know, everywhere in the lots of places in the country, they publish the weekly police log. And the weekly police log is, A was arrested for shoplifting at such and such address on such and such date. And you know, they may or may not, usually they don't have mug shots included, but occasionally they do. But you know, this is just a routine list that gets disseminated to the media, probably by most police departments throughout the country. And that stuff gets archived, it gets searchable, it becomes searchable. Um, and it has nothing to do with the extortion industry we were talking about, but it's out there. What do you, what, would you say basically the police should not, should not create these logs, should not release them? Um, yes, yeah, so first of all, my, my answer would be yes. I think that's the essence of what I'm suggesting in terms of not everything should be public. I mean, arrest records, which is not even what I'm doing. I'm dealing with expungement. I'm dealing with after conviction. Arrest records should not be public. I mean, if you just, uh, if we look around the world and see other jurisdictions, arrest records are usually not public, open to the public. In Israel, for example, um, even if you were arrested, no one is entitled by yourself and the state to go to a police department and ask whether you have a criminal history record. What you would do is if an employer, and there's a lot of different uh, uh, regulation that you must apply to, if you want to know, and it's a very, for, for example, uh, important job working with the government, you would have to get some certificate of good conduct. You will personally go to the police department and ask for that, and then you can show your employer, I really do not have. But if we go back to your question, I would say that, yes, public records are important, but we need to differentiate between what is really important in public records, what should be public. Arrest records, from my point of view, from my point of view, doesn't mean anything about an individual. The fact that you were arrested for shoplifting didn't mean that you are a shoplifter. Right. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you were arrested. That's why we have a legal system. And what a way to end it. Thank yeah. you very much, Eldar. Thank this you. was fascinating. <laughs>